everybody. We'd like to welcome you and thank you very much for coming out. I know it's a lot in your day, but we do appreciate it. And you are the parents that we really love to talk to because you're involved and you make things happen. So give yourself an applause because we do appreciate it. This morning we are putting this on. We are the uh, Coalition for the Good of the Children, which is a we comprise of all the principals of the island, and we work in conjunction with Melissa and Andrew as part of the Community Foundation. So we'd like to uh, welcome and introduce ourselves to you. So that we are here for you, and we are here to do whatever you guys would like. So we're here to help you with any topics that you'd like us to talk about. Um, with the principals, we are here for for the children and for the good of them. And as part of our ongoing effort to work cohesively with the community, uh, we meet on a regular basis to help to present information to you. So a lot of topics that we have out there, children are exposed to gizmos and gadgets, and we don't know what they are, and you don't know what they are, and their friends have one, so they feel like, okay, it's okay, we should have one too. Well, sometimes we don't know the dangers of all of those things. So what we're trying to do is find out what's going on, and today we're bringing up some topics for you one having to do with the vaping. Um, sounds like a good way of doing something, but we don't know the dangers that are bringing in. So we've got people here to talk to you about things like that. We've got people to talk to you about distracted driving, and I know we're probably all a little bit guilty of all of that, you know? It's easy to look down and look for a text, but we've got people to talk to you and see what happens with any of these things. Um, also, cyberbullying. It's another topic that we're gonna be bringing up today. When you think your child is, it, it's never going to happen to them. Guess what? We're a small island and it does happen. So to find out a little bit of information, see all the education you can get yeah. for this year or maybe years to come, okay. it, it'll only benefit you. It. So we want to thank you guys for coming for each of these things. Um, we are going to start this morning uh, with Jeff. Jeff is a target of severe type of online uh, defamation. And cyberbullying is real. And it can happen to anybody. And Jeff and a team of his experts have created the set of data-driven models, or mobile tools, to create and enforce the boundaries necessary for safety and wellness in schools. Um, so we are going to talk with Jeff. Let me give you a little bit about, um, we're gonna also have Debbie Weinikoff, who is here. Debbie Weinikoff, um, she's a mother and an educator with, a, with an extremely, very personal, devastating story of a tragedy that could have been avoided. Um, Debbie's going to talk to us about the texting and driving, or we're putting the phone down, or put it in a sock, you know, so there's different things. She's on a mission to make sure that there's zero incidents happening, so she's going to give you her story. And we also have Anna Moreno. She's a therapist, an interventionist, consultant, and educator in Miami. She's going to speak to us today about the dangers and addiction of vaping and substance abuse. So there's three very important topics. We hope you get a lot out of this, and we want to welcome you, and thank you for coming. Hi, good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jeff, Hi, Jeff, and I'm going to show you a video. It's about 60 seconds, and it's on my website, and it'll kind of set the stage for the rest of the talk this morning. My objective this morning is for us to have a conversation about what's going on out there very briefly, because we all know what's going on out there, and there's too much of that, and all the bad choices that are being made. Uh, but secondarily, talk about what we can be doing and what tools are available uh, to address the the epidemic, which is a global epidemic in terms of decency and uh, decent communication, which is the fundamentals of everything that we're seeing today. So I'm going to show a video. I'll take you through some slides, and then we'll do some Q&A. Um, and uh, I'll talk about the schools that we're in in South Florida right now and what we're doing, the principles we're working with, uh, and how we're really trying to address the problem of not just cyberbullying, but <coughs> online conflict in general.
problem's been around now for a decade, right? We all deal with it every day. How many photos will be taken this year in the world? 1.2 trillion. It's 1,200 billion. It's three and a half billion people with devices in the world today. And we're all in a reactionary mode, and we're all trying to address this problem that's disconnecting us, severely disconnecting us, because we don't make eye content anymore. We don't know how to connect. We can't connect. We can't have great memories. We don't have great memories and nostalgia. We can't cope when problems come along. We can't deal with anxiety. So social media, which is the greatest, worst experiment that we've ever seen, jump shifted us to a whole new world. It's not like the telephone and the telegraph at the turn of the last century, which created great disruption as well, right? Because you had buggy whips and carts and you had to write letters and wait. We don't wait anymore. And to build relationships requires us to have conversations, to read people, to understand, to do things together. So part of the solution that we'll talk about today is how do we get back to more group activities, more team sports, more social cognition, and learning how to cope. But before we get start, started, I have a young man, Will von Cham, who's also taking pictures. And he's also an incredible spoken word artist. And maybe you guys have heard him before. But we recently did a show with the Miami Heat. And, um, and the fifth graders at Orangebrook Elementary School in Broward County. And Will kicked it off, and we'll show you that short video later. But I want to introduce Will, and uh, so everyone kind of take it away. Let me hear everybody say kindness. Kindness. Say kindness. Kindness. Better future. Better future. Better future. Better future. Now, if you like spoken word, how, does anybody, if anybody's here from a with spoken word, I need to hear you snap. Can I everybody snap real quick? All right, all right. Spoken word poetry. I hope you enjoy it. If I take the word bully and replace the L's in that word with D's, the word bully is erased and I'm a buddy in need because this world has enough L's. Do I need to add any more? If I see my classmates like my teammates, then shouldn't I help them score? Of course. I was created to make everybody around me better so we could all leave like champs, like cheeseburgers from checkers. This world has enough problems, and you weren't created for defeat. So don't forget to give yourself a win today, back to back like the Miami Heat. Hey. That's my time. Hey. I hope you enjoyed it. My name is Will Fonch. Thank you all for your time. Amazing presentation. Let's go. Thanks, Will. Look, life is about memorable events, right? So how do you create a memorable event? And that's what we have to do. And that's what we have to focus on. And we have to take the time to do it. Some of you have heard my story before. I'm going to tell it very briefly because I think it's important as to why I'm here. Uh, I'm a CPA by training. My parents didn't go to college. I ended up, I'll stand still, um, I ended up uh, getting my MBA in finance from Columbia. I went to Wall Street. I was an investment banker. I ran hedge funds, about 15 of them, the largest, ran $7 billion of positions every day, traded the market around the world, every type of security and derivative you can think of. Um, and my job was to measure the volatility of the market. Things are going well, add to it. Things are going poorly, sell it, right? Maximize the return for your investors. The market is nothing more than a reflection of how we feel as a community, as a society. It's about our confidence. When everyone's confident, everything's going to be better and hopeful in the future, we load the boat and the market goes up. When people are nervous, we pull away and the market goes down. That's important because, and you're about to find out, Along the way, um, I was introduced on my career to a very bad person. I didn't know it at the time, but I figured it out. I've done a lot of due diligence. Turns out he was running a Ponzi scheme pre-Madoff. I turned him over to the FBI. He went to prison. Two and a half years later, he got out after Madoff, got deported out of the country, put up a website, 
It was a level two Google site at the time, which was a big deal, and destroyed my reputation. Such that if you Googled me from 2008 through 2012, it said ConvyCon at the top of my website, my web search. Clicked on it, went to a, a picture of my wife and I. I've been married almost 30 years. Clicked again, it went to this level two website that said I was a convict and a con artist, just like he was. I was in the trust business, right? People were giving me money. In a post-Madoff world, I had the ultimate identity threat. And what were my recourse mechanisms? How could I remediate my problem? What laws could I rely on? And the answer was, not much. Because the internet is an unregulated, ungoverned jungle. And these phones that we give our children are the entrance to that jungle every day. We build safe houses, we connect with our kids, we send them to the best schools, right? And then we give them a phone that says, hey man, go figure it out in the jungle, right? These are the challenges. I went to court, I became an expert in defamation, defamation per se. I met hundreds of parents whose kids were cutting, attempted suicide, suicide ideation, pulled out of school permanently, parents whose, parent, whose children had taken their lives. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing today, right? Because when someone's depressed, they go through anxiety, to depression, to loneliness, to complete, exclusion and self-exclusion, and sometimes it's really hard to get them off that path, as hard as you do. So I looked at all the tools and all the rules and governing bodies that have been set up to help protect kids online. COPA, FERPA, HIPAA, SIPA, the Patriot Act, right? These are all the rules that were there to protect our kids from the internet that Mr. Zuckerberg and a couple others created, right? But the problem is, they're laws, they're rules, they're reactionary, and they're after the fact. Yeah, right? And guess what? The damage is already done. And as we all know, the internet is still written in ink, and it's forever. And so we have to have a new narrative. We have to have a new approach, because over the last 10 years, the rates of teen suicide between the ages of 10 and 24 have gone up on an average of 10 to 15% a year. Over 6,500 students will commit suicide successfully this year, right? They will take their lives. Another three to 400,000 will attempt, right? The number of critically depressed students in this country, according to the last survey, which was 2018, in grades six through 12, of which there are 25 million students in public schools today, says that 3.1 million are seriously depressed, and only 20% are getting help. And that number keeps growing. Wellness is a huge issue, right? And it's global, and it's being addressed globally by different countries better than others. I bring this up because to feel well, to feel good, you have to connect. You have to have friends. And we have less friends today. We have less people we trust and confide in. And guess what? Human beings need two things. They need to feel safe, according to our little amygdalas in the brain, and we need to feel connected. If we have less friends, guess what? We're less connected. If we're less connected, we have less positive moments. We have less nostalgia. Our abilities to cope are decreased. So it's a very important thing. I won my court case in federal district court. I won a $2 million judgment I'd never collect but I got the right to take it all down. What if you could just take it down, right? Why can't we just take it down? Why? We're parents, we have children. I have a 19 and a 22 year old, right? But they were young, right? Why can't we just take it down? So when I won my court case, I wrote law on how to take it down. I wrote a process and a system to do it. I took it before Chief Judge Holderman, who heard my case, one of the leading IP judges in the country. I showed it to him. He goes, if this was there, you never would have had your problem. He goes, I'll support you privately anywhere in the country with any politician, any judge out there. And I told Chief Judge Holderman, I said, well, as I've done my research in the three or four hundred research studies that I read from around the world on cyberbullying, bullying, online defamation, sexual harassment, 
I realized that the, the numbers were getting worse, and I'm like, the kids are dying at a greater rate. They're suffering at a greater rate. I gave you the rate of increase for 10 to 24. 10 to 14 is increasing at 25% a year off a lower base, right? The average age of serious depression in the 1960s, and the numbers are a little skewed, were somewhere around 25 to 30. Now it's around 14. So what do we do, right? So I looked at this problem from not a reactive on the heels, where we can't manage it, right, but a proactive perspective. How do we create tools, right, because everyone's got a smartphone, it's not going back in the, in the bottle, the genie's not going back, it's not going away. So we have to write a new narrative using the most powerful communication device ever created, those 1.2 trillion photos that are gonna be taken this year, right? And there's probably eight trillion texts that will be sent this year. And how many photos and texts will be sent this year? We are now being dominated by the media and social media and our phones, and so are our kids. And we're setting culture at the margin off a cell phone that we're addicted to and we have to touch all the time, right? So how do we get ahead of it? And so at Bridget, I put together a team of experts in social psychology, forensic psychology, sexual harassment, um, leading educators to really come up with a program that was proactive, that could allow the students to learn positive digital behavior, right? How do we all learn to socialize? We model the behavior of our parents and friends. And what does socialize mean? We learn where boundaries are, how to talk to people, right? What we can and can't say, what we can, can we break into your zone? Can I give you a hug, right? We can't even give hugs today because everyone's saying, oh, you're a sexual harasser, right? There's studies on hugs that say, <laughs> there's studies on hugs that say, if, we had, if you had a five minute hug every day with someone, right, after two weeks, your serotonin levels in your brain, which make you feel good over the long term, go up by 25%, right? So we're doing it wrong, so we need to rewrite the narrative. But we have to use that little device that we're all addicted to, to do it. So we all, I just said, we all learn to socialize by modeling the behavior of our parents. So when you gave your child or your student or allowed them to have that phone, how did you practice with them? How did you model positive digital communication so that they would develop the routines and the rewards to allow them to successfully communicate and connect with people? And the answer is we didn't. And we didn't do it either. <coughs> Right? We just went on and experimented. And we've seen everything on that internet. And there's a lot of harmful, harmful things that we shouldn't see. There's a lot of great things that opens ourselves up to the world, but the harmful stuff sticks with us as well. So my team and I, we sat down and we said, okay, if we can create a positive social network that is closed and private just for a school community, and why a school community? Because every day the students walk in, right? And they see each other. And they either know each other well, they like each other, don't like each other. So they have feelings of happiness, joy, and fear at every person they pass, right? And they ha you want to overcome the fear, right? So we want to reduce the fear, we want to maximize the happiness. Well, how do we do that? If they're all on their phones, if they're all disconnected. The idea was that if we can create a community within a school where the most important person is the principal because they set culture. They are the leaders of, of that school. And if they can be broadcasting only positive things, right, all the times and reminding us that, hey, there are dangers out there in terms of the internet and what's going on, but there's also social emotional learning you have to do, how to make friends, how to read other people, how to greet them. And if we can create this, it used to be called character education in the 1950s. We now call it social emotional learning. But it's all the same. It's about getting to know people, getting to respect them, getting to understand our differences and accept those differences. And then behavioral volatility goes down. The negative behavioral volatility goes down. So we created this network over the last five years. We've tested it, we've launched it, we've changed cultures. And it starts with the leader and secondarily, the most powerful force in any school to set culture 
it's not really the teachers and the principals. They have a, a critical role, but it's really the students. And you have to empower them in the right way to practice positive social cognition, showing affirmations, right, to one another and self-affirmations. Because the more I recognize, and I say, I really like your glasses, right? You're gonna smile. I smile at you, you engage back with me, right? Nice watch, great shoes, turn off your phone. You know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, it's also being told. No, so it's, I always look at phones, that's why. No, keep taking your notes, I do the same thing. So, <laughs> that's great. So there is a way, and there's a new narrative, and we can do it, but we have to think outside the box. We can't rely on legislators, and we can't rely on principles to enforce, because that's not their job, right? And the way the world has been set up in this country and around the world in terms of principles is if they have too many behavioral incidents, they're bad principles. Not true, but it's a very punitive system, right? And then they're taking a lot of risk. So they're put in this catch-22 position where they do a ton of work on the social-emotional side with their staffs, probably five times what you really realize. They're only allowed to report 20% of the bad, because if they report 40, 60, or 80% of the bad, then all the parents are like, this is a bad school, let's get rid of them. You know, we're too quick to react. So we create an incredible reporting system with the ability to have the teachable moments right there. It was hard to get into the schools. So we flipped it. We said we have to, we have to and the whole idea is to identify those kids at risk. The kids who are excluded, right? And the kids who are disconnected and bullying, right? So you wanna find out that group of kids that are being bullied and the ones who are bullies. And they always self-exclude. If you can't do it from a reporting perspective, which is really hard to do, on the negative side, what if you could do it on the positive side? So what do I mean by that? So if I give you, every day I have to give you a shout out, and we're in the same class, and I do that, and I've gotta give shout outs to the rest of my students over time, the rest of my, my colleagues and students, you know, I'm engaging in positive social communication, I'm affirming who you are, I'm recognize you, you may recognize me back, I may give myself a win, and if you have this ability to practice this type of recognition in a way that uses the phones, that uses digital technology, what we found is you can identify the students who aren't engaged, right? From a positive perspective. Because we're trying to identify the at-risk group, which are those students that are hurting, that are lonely, that are depressed, and they don't come up and tell you, right? They kind of slowly withdraw into the background. They step away. And, it's hard to, and it becomes harder and harder to communicate with them as they step away. So we built tools to practice positivity, practice recognition of one another, and out of those tools, we use the data to identify who's not participating. Right? And who's not receiving? Right? So you know who's not giving and participating, and you know who's not receiving the positivity. And you end up with that same set of students that are at risk. But now you've done it through a positive lens, right? So now you've taken the risk out of the system for the principal and the leadership of the school because it's an overwhelming <laughs> problem. We should just all acknowledge that. And it's five times worse than we all think because kids only talk about maybe 10 to 15% of all the harm that they see or are part of online. So we have to have a different narrative. So I want to uh, take you through a couple slides um, and then I think I will touch on a couple other subjects. But uh, to get in this mindset of a new narrative, uh, we really just need to step back. So what if Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, which is a video game, you know, we're only positive. You couldn't say anything negative, right? How much conflict, how much pain would be gone, would never have happened? How many kids would not have cut? How many kids wouldn't be depressed or severely depressed, right? How many children would still be alive today, yeah. right? It's a very simple argument to make, right? And so if we created social media, responsibly with some forethought and taking some planning to think about the ramifications and the knock-on effects, we would have done that, but we didn't. So 
this is why we created Bridget, right? It's about social pain, which is the same as physical pain. It's the same receptors in the brain, and it's how do you leverage positive psychology and acts of kindness? Because guess what? They're the biggest sources of dopamine in the world, is to recognize someone else, to give, right? And also the largest sources of serotonin, which are the long-term happy chem chemicals. But the practice of positive digital behavior allows you to cope. Because once you've done it one time, and you're having a bad day, but you know if I do something nice for someone when I'm having a tough day, I'm gonna feel better. Guess what? I was able to change my mindset, right? Very quickly. And having these conversations and really doing it, this is what we have to do in terms of getting there, right? So what Bridget is, because it's short session today, so I'm not gonna go too deep, but it's really this positive social network, right? And it's all about identifying the students who are disconnected and promoting positivity and connectivity through acknowledgement, through belonging cues. The more I make contact with you, the more times I make contact with you, either through handshake, eye contact, recognition, smiling at you, it's the number of times that make us feel more connected. It's not how deep they are, right? I don't have to have long, deep conversations with everyone. I can just make contact. So if we can have students have more positive communication, like when they were in third grade and they're on the playground. Kids are, think about that. How happy are they? How many people are they running into? Everyone. When they have a problem, it gets solved right away, right? So you have to step back out of our adult mindsets with all these rules and all our biases and prejudices that we've developed over the years and say, what do we have to do to allow people to connect? We made it in a way that educators will like because it's about measuring the whole student, right? <coughs> it's about recognizing people for what they think they're good at and reaffirming that. Like I was an athlete in high school, so if someone said, hey, great job on the tennis team, Jeff, I'd feel good. I was good at school, so getting an A and being recognized for that. I wasn't really good at singing, but other people were, and you'd recognize them for that. Everyone has two or three things, and you can all think of what they are, of what you think you're good at. That is your identity. That gets established in kind of grades four through nine, right? And during that period, the more positivity that we can infuse, the more supportive statements, the more positive recognition that we can give, and the more positive self-recognition we can give, the more confidence, perseverance, and the, more, the greater our ability to deal with problems. They create shout outs. So from an educator's perspective, it's, not, it's really about Maslow's hierarchy, right? Where are we hurting today? Well, we all have food for the most part, right? But we're hurting in safety. Kids don't feel safe at school, right? We're hurting in belonging, connectedness, and love, because there's a, just not enough when you ask the students, right? And then really in terms of self-esteem and self-confidence, it's, go, it's go waning. So these are needs that we need socially that are not being addressed. So we have to come up with ways to address it. And it's through conversations, it's through activities, it's by getting together and doing things together and creating those positive memories as we go along. Um, I don't wanna go too much into the details of what, what we have, but basically we created a private social network. Only the kids and teachers and parents, if the teachers want the parents to be, are in it. And it's all about the positivity and positive communication. It's all about restorative practices which are the right teachable moments, right? How to address a particular situation. How to get to understanding and remorse. That's, it's that simple. But it's hard to do today because you have to connect with the kids, right? And for me, connecting with my son in his senior year, it meant I had to walk up the stairs because he wouldn't come down and see me. I had to look at him on the couch. He was on his phone. He was in a chat group. He was on his computer and he was playing a video game all at the same time. So like everyone else today, we live in a world of mass distraction. And it's not healthy, right, in terms of what we're doing. So the whole idea is to have all the teachable moments here, 
for parents, teachers, and students so they can self-help, right? And so that you're making the right choices when things happen and you're guiding correctly. We also have incident reporting, which is to identify, but it's more to identify and then follow through on the application of well, what was the conversation we had? Was it impactful? Did it help? Do we need more help? Technology is good for two things, speed and efficiency. Nothing else, right? Nothing else. Okay, I know it brings you your Netflix and all that, and we all watch it. But in reality, it doesn't bring a lot more to the table. We're human beings, and we've always needed to connect. We now live in this disconnected world where we're highly mobile, where communities are now constantly changing. So there's no support structure there. So today, more than ever, as parents, we have to connect with our, with our kids. And we have to help our kids connect with other kids on a human level, in an activity-based level in terms of what we're doing. It can be online gaming if they're all working together because you're not going to get rid of it. But it can't be on a solitude basis as, you know, in terms of what we're doing. So in terms of what we do and, and in terms of the platform, we just make it very easy for anyone to send a shout out. It's all controlled. It's all pre-written. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Well, yes. I, I am a grandmother here, <laughs> and uh, 12 and 5 years old. And what I think today is so dangerous, the world of today, that it was in my time, in your time, in other people's, other people's time, is not, it was not as dangerous as today. Right. And uh, at least 
um, I'm a sociologist also, and a uh, PhD and everything. And uh, what I know, this is great enterprises like Facebook and all the people who created it. Right. They are not for their, their children. Right. Prohibited for their children is to sell to us, you know, that are not right. very well advised. Right. Yes. So how how do we use this app? It has to be inculcated by the school, or it's something that we can buy for our kids. So right right now we're launching in schools, right? So we're doing it at the school level and the community level, right? So that it's run because that's where the students are together the most, right? And that's where you want to promote it. So having a set predefined community on a human level makes putting this in place, so they have their own community. So that's where. And we're in, going into 50 schools in Brooklyn, we're in Broward, we're expanding in Broward in terms of what we're doing down there. Um, and there's demand on the West Coast as well. So yeah, it's, it's a B2B app for right now. In the next couple of years, we'll have a B2C version. But for now, it's, it's really set up that way. And it's, it's $5 a year for a student. So it's a de minimis cost. You know, we're not really in it for the money. My question is, how can we see the details? Because if we're just getting so you, you can go to our website, you can sign up for a WebEx, and we'll give you a WebEx on it, and it'll be a 20-minute WebEx. There's a whole series of videos that actually lay it out. So the website's quite informative on both social-emotional learning as well as the technology we've created. Um, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation has already agreed to sponsor the first school in Miami-Dade County. Um, all we need is agreement with the school, and we can bring the programming in. So once we have the school identified, uh, we will sponsor the funding for the school. One example of how this program helped. There was a student on a Saturday, this is a New York school, who was communicating with a friend who was threatening suicide. She sent a note to the principal because the principal was the administrator of their Bridget program. Contacted the student to make sure that it was real and not just a joke. Contact decided, figured out that it was real, contacted the home. The father was in distress. The kid was locked in their, her bedroom. He couldn't get her out, didn't know what to do. The principal said, Go tell your daughter to come to the phone because the principal wants to talk to her. She came out of her room. Parents discovered a whole row of pills, so this potential suicide attempt was real. They stopped that attempt. Obviously, you have to continue with, you can't just drop it. But these are a group of kids who got into this program and figured out how to, at least on that particular it's been implemented in the schools in Brooklyn, our first pilot schools, five years ago. Behavioral incidents have dropped 66 percent. Academics have gone up 12, 13 percent year over year in standardized tests on level three. So we don't have enough of a data set yet, but we've interviewed all the students, and a lot of those videos are aligned. So it's really it makes them feel safe, and that's what it's about. Because a safe learning environment lets everything else happen. Jeff, the work, the work that you've been doing with Orange, remember that Orange Brook? Orange Brook. And Tony, uh, Tony Ferentino and, and uh, yeah. and I think I can show it. It's a 60 cent vi video. Can I show it? It's about inspiring kids and motivating them to get them engaged, right? To motivate people, you either coerce them, carrot or stick them, or you inspire them. If you inspire them, it lasts and makes it their own. So we've brought celebrities in and we've created now and we're working with the Miami Heat to have the celebrities go to the school, talk about long-term values and what, and what made them great and what they persevered at. We match the, the celebrities with the school culture and we create a memorable moment that the kids love, right? And then we extend it because on the platform you have all the positives of push technology. So now that celebrity can give a shout out to the whole school and get a shout back. So now we change social media and give it a positive feedback loop.
everyone starts to win. And then you run a contest with the heat, which we're doing with an experiential reward going to a game, and you get large scale participation in the student body. And then you pull the parents in as well. So the idea is to create longer term memorable moments that the kids can grab onto. Is this an actual app that's going to go onto the kids' phones? It's, is this a platform? It's a, it's a platform technology. <laughs> it works on any web enabled device. And it's got Android and iOS applications. So the kids actually have to go onto the onto the website. I can set up a school in Florida if they have Clever in about ten minutes, right? Um, and I'll be around till noon. But thank you very much. Bridget, Bridget.com. I'd like to introduce Debbie Wanakoff, who is going to speak about distracted driving and techniques to teach our kids. Um, our kids learn from us. So this is an opportunity if you have young children to get them into positive behavior modeling for not texting and driving, not using your phone while you're in the car, and hands-free free driving. Jeff, thank you so much. That was incredible. Good morning. My name is Debbie Wanningkoff. And I want to thank you for being here. I would like to thank Melissa White and Andrew Britton and the Key Biscayne Community Foundation for inviting me and for sponsoring this important forum. My topic is cell phone distracted driving. Cell phone distracted driving has become a killer epidemic in the United States. I am a road safety advocate on a mission to prevent crashes on our roads caused by cell phone distraction. I do this to honor my son, Patrick, who was killed by a cell phone distracted driver while biking across the country, building houses for the underserved. I do this with the support of my husband, Rick, who is in the audience. Patrick's. Patrick's sister and best friend, Suzette, and other family members and friends. I have spent the last two years in Tallahassee, our state capital, fighting for tougher common sense legislation. On July 1, 2019, texting while driving became a primary offense in Florida. School zones and work zones became hands-free zones. It is now illegal to text and drive in Florida or to pick up your phone in a school or work zone. But legislation is only part of the solution. We need drivers who are committed to safe driving. My hope is that we will leave here with a new commitment to road safety. The videos you are about to see are graphic. <sighs> Well, sorry, no sound. I am knowledgeable about the dangers of distracted driving, but I do not claim to be an expert. But I am an expert in the devastating consequences it causes. I am an expert in the despair it causes. I am an expert in the injury it causes. Patrick's friend Bridget was critically injured the day that Patrick was killed. There is no going back. There is no going back to change or fix things. Patrick's death has shattered the lives of my family and all who knew him. Bridget's injury 
has changed her life forever. There are many statistics about the dangers of distracted driving. If I told you a few, you might remember them. But what you will remember is that a mother stood before you with her son's memorial bookmark with the date of his birth and death. On the back it reads, Patrick rides on. Patrick Wanninghoff lived for adventure, bicycles, and social justice while on a charity cross-country cycling trip with Bike and Build in the summer of 2015. He was killed by a cell phone distracted driver. Patrick was an engineer, a physics and computer science teacher, a bassist, a cyclist, and an incredible friend, brother, and son. <coughs> he devoted himself to his students in the Bronx and taught them to fail harder. Patrick loved music, poetry, modern art, coffee, and life. In his short 25 years, he accomplished more than most people do in a lifetime. If I could go back and replay the day that Patrick was killed and Bridget was severely injured and take the cell phone out of the hands of the negligent driver named Sarah, a nursing supervisor in her mid-30s on her way to work. If only I could do that. If only she would have had made the right choice to not pick up her phone. It's a choice. But I can't go back, so I go forward. Forward to this moment, using Patrick's life to save others. Although it would never be our intention to hurt another, if we choose to engage with our cell phone while driving, it is a choice that will put ourselves and others at risk. Although it would never be our intention to put our own children at risk and teach them dangerous habits. It is a choice that we make when we pick up our phone when we are in the driver's seat. Most of us pay attention when we are driving, and only rarely do we get distracted by our phones. But sometimes you may think, it's no big deal. I'm at a red light. I'm stuck in traffic. I'm not on the highway. I'm a good driver. Nothing's going to happen. Or maybe not. Maybe you don't even think about it. Because it is so ingrained as acceptable, more than socially acceptable, expected to respond immediately to a text, email, or notification. And so we continue to do what we usually do without considering the possible consequences. So let us now consider how we can make road safety a priority. I would like to highlight a few points. Multitasking, a human delusion. <laughs> MIT neuroscientist Earl Miller said, the brain is very good at deluding itself. We simply can't focus on more than one thing at a time. What we can do is shift our focus from one thing to the next with astonishing speed. Switching from task to task, you think you're actually paying attention to everything around you at the same time, but you're actually not. Patrick and Bridget were hit at a speed of 85 miles per hour. Patrick died at the scene. Bridget was medevaced with a severe leg injury. She has had 12 surgeries, constant pain management, and therapies. This is the story of Casey Feldman from Philadelphia, who was at a summer job in Ocean City, crossing the street at a crosswalk. A driver looking at his phone, traveling at the speed of 15 miles an hour, failed to see the four-way stop and struck her. She died five days later in the hospital. So what happened to Sarah, the driver? Sarah was convicted of felony first degree manslaughter. She went to jail. She is on probation for 15 years. She had to pay financial restitution to Bridget Anderson. 
and do community service. So you can see how many lives this affects. Our family, Bridget's family, everyone who knew Patrick, have been racked with grief and pain and devastation. Florida's distracted drivers rank second worst in the US. This is a Miami Herald article from 2017. Second only to Louisiana. So the proof piled up, statistics soared, death tolls rose. Finally, lawmakers acted. Now it is illegal to text and drive in Florida. Typically, distracted driving laws go from texting while driving as a secondary offense to a primary offense to hands-free. Hands-free states, these are the states that are hands-free. There are about 20 of them. <coughs> distracted driving is impaired driving and has become an epidemic. We need to make cell phone distracted driving socially unacceptable, just like drunk and drugged driving, to protect pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists. If you feel that Florida should go hands-free, I will give you information about doing that. In fact, there's a lot of information in the back. There's Patrick's bookmark, information from the Florida Department of Transportation about the law. So this law affects many people. We have 21 million people in the state of Florida, 116 million visitors yearly. This law affects a lot of people. So what can you do? What can be your action? Silence your phone. Put it in the do not disturb mode. Use a drive mode app like AT&T and others. Sock it away. This is what I teach the kids. I know the person who has the other sock because I made a commitment with that person. His name is Brett. We had a talk. I silence my phone and I sock it away before I start my car. You might want to do this with your kids. Preset your GPS. Choose a designated texter. Pull over to use your phone. It may be inconvenient, but it may save a life. Be phone free. Discuss road safety with your family. Speak up if the driver of your car is distracted. It may protect you and them. And this is who you can contact, and that information is in the back, and there's an example letter. If you feel serious about this topic, safety serious, young drivers, they need help, and we need to make our laws stronger. Texting while driving causes over a million and a half accidents per year. 130,000 injuries and 11 teen deaths every day. You are 23 times more likely to be in a crash if you are texting and driving. My son was 25 years old at the time of his death. He was a bicycle safety instructor with many hours of training. Our younger children are inexperienced and especially vulnerable. Riding a bike, walking, skateboarding can be dangerous because of driver inattention. Driving a car is a huge responsibility for all of us, but particularly for a new teen driver. Kids absolutely need their parents to set an example of safe driving. If not, your habits will become their habits. Also, I've noticed quite a few young people on the street, biking, walking, skateboarding, and on their phones. They seem to be totally oblivious of the dangers. We need to talk to our kids and train them to be safety-minded and do the safe thing. We need to be serious about safety. Safety first. There are few things that we have control over in our lives, but this is one of them. Let us use our power to protect ourselves and everyone else. Let us make a choice to give our full attention to the 4,000 pound vehicle that can be a weapon when used carelessly. 
Do not live a life of pain and regret. Please drive phone free. Let your choice be a, one of safety, protection, and respect for the lives of all. I hope you will be safety serious, safety smart, and you will drive phone free. I would like to thank Billy Sergio, one of Patrick's best friends who made this PowerPoint. As I said, there is information in the back of the room. Uh, this is a video, uh, Channel 12 News in the Bronx, with some words from Patrick's students at the Fordham High School for the Arts, where he taught physics and computer science. It was made by one of his students named Lucero Luna. News 12, the Bronx reporter, Rena Roy, has the story from Fordham High School of the Arts. It was the kind of class you waited all day for. Walking into his classroom, it was, it was not really my classroom. Because Captain Blancoff was the kind of teacher that made physics fun. My day could be going really bad, but entering around for a conference class and just be like, good morning. In just three years at Fordham High School for the Arts, Blancoff made a name for himself. Blancoff, he wasn't like any other teacher. It was teacher, and then it was Blancoff. Maybe it was a beatbox <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Be safe, be smart. Allowed to have a hands-free foot conversation, which is also distressing. It, a a right Bluetooth uh, conversation is also distracted, but right. that would not be included. A hands-free would mean that you could not have the phone in your hand or touching any part of your body. Uh, it has been proven that um, when you are talking on the phone, you miss visual cues, okay, for one thing. Your reaction time slows, and if you have an emotional conversation, it takes it to another level. Kids ask me, well, what about if I'm talking to the person next to me? That's not quite as bad, because at least you have another set of eyes on the road. I walk to school, to the public school, every morning, every afternoon, with a five years old and 11 years old. I would really ask for the police to reinforce the fines because there is, you are here, you are responsible, but you have no idea how many mothers do not listen, do not obey, do not do anything, and they are on the phone in the school, in the surrounding, and running, and all this. I see this every day. And you know, if I am a, I'm a grandma, I have the right to say, you get out of your phone. I say it, you lousy mother. Yeah. I want the police to give them a very heavy fight, because it's the only thing to learn, it's a fight. I followed the statute that you helped get passed, and I've watched the 
semi publicity on it. The question I have, and I'm sorry that uh, Chuck Press isn't here, I, just living here and wandering around the village, do not believe that most of the people in the village understand what it's all about. And a huge number of people are simply ignoring it. And I don't really see the level of enforcement that I thought you wanted to bring to the process. And I and I am not a normal crit critic of the police department. I just feel that it's, a, it's another one of the new new uh, requirements that we I don't believe that the village has taken seriously. Well, police chief press is very serious, and there have been police officers out on Crandon Boulevard with binoculars and stopping people for this. I mean, they can't be on every street, and enforcement is the key. Enforcement is the key. There's information back there about the new law. All of you can tell one person, two people, tell them driving and texting is illegal. And I'm hoping the law enforcement does get up, but they're, they're, they're working. And, and we have, we have blasted, blasted it throughout our, I'm sorry. We have blasted it throughout our school, schools. We have um, banners in all of our schools. So hopefully people look at those banners and we'll continue to promote. Um, I would like to know why we're only saying socket to the kids. I think we have to say socket to ourselves, and I think we need to start a socket campaign. Oh, thank you. Socket away. No, <laughs> seriously, if we do not step up and set up, set the example, and make it, I'm going to say worldwide, but let's start village-wide, saying it is not going to be long-lasting. But we have to continue to do it, and I think uh, getting everybody to buy a pair of socks, and one of them is for your phone, and give it to somebody else for a phone, and that includes whether you're in the golf cart, whether you're walking across the street, or that's Thank you so much. I hope that your hearts are changed from the story, and that you will put safety first and take it seriously and do some of the things we talked about today. Thank you so much. Again, lead by example. That's what we all have to do. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd also now like to introduce Anna Moreno. Uh, she's got some great information for you. So please, let's listen to her with all of her great information. Thank you. What a wonderful turnout for being a, a weekday morning. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to Chief Lang, who has had me uh, kind of like two or three times now for the team talk series here on the Key. So I, I thank you for that and, and what you're, you and your team do every day. How many of you have teenagers? Oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to see if any parents relate to this, right? Kind of going on what, what Jeff had mentioned and how, how we communicate with technology, right? This is a series of text messages from mom to either son or daughter, and it says, don't forget to unload the dishwasher. Did you finish your homework? We have to go to your grandmother's house for Thanksgiving. No answer. Dad and I talked. We're going to buy you a car next month. You are? Oh my God, thank you. No, we're not. I just wanted to make sure you were getting my touch. That was cool. Anyone relate to that? Yes, right? Um, so, yeah, I saw that, and, I, and, and you know, I, of course, I am a, an immigrant to technology, but I, I look at this, and I'm like, yeah, that would have been me, uh, you know, not answering my mom at that point until... Well, you know, of course, we're going to get you a car, and I'm like, yeah, I'm bored, and then be like, yeah, no, just kidding. Um, so, um, I'm going to speak to you today about the dangers of vaping, but before I do that, I just want to give a quickie, and this is going to be a really big quickie, on the adolescent and the young adult brain, okay? Because it's real important to understand what they are capable of and what they're not capable of. 
at, at this stage growing up. So real quick, at about the age of 11 or 12, children start to develop the ability to think abstractly. Prior to that, they think very concretely. You tell a seven-year-old, we're going to Disney in 10 days. That kid's up the stairs packed and ready to go right now. This whole like 10 days, what is this 10 days? This means like right now, we gotta go right now. Um, so once they hit that age is then they'll be able to grasp concepts of, of time and, and just some sayings like, you know, oh, you need to take it one day at a time. You know, they'll grasp that. When they're younger, they'll look at you like one day at a time. What are you talking about? It's like, you know, they can't get that. The reward center of the brain, that part that lights up, that part that secretes all that dopamine and serotonin and all the happy juices, fully developed by the time they're 12 or 13. Okay, so that ability is right there. From the age of about 12, 13, up until about the age of 25, the brain goes through a huge growth spurt in, in, in being able to develop emotional maturity and the maturity of a brain. The brain develops from back to front. So we got the limbic and the reward fully developed, 12 or 13, and then it starts to progress forward. The amygdala stores a couple of things. It stores the feelings of when they do something. So if they do something that they like and they're happy and the dopamine and the serotonin start to go, that's stored in the amygdala, okay? What's also stored in the amygdala has to develop as the fear factor, which isn't quite done until the 20s. Our kids, and I remember my growing up, I thought I was invincible, right? Uh, nothing would happen to me, that happens to them. Yeah, right? Uh, and I know as I look back, I am very grateful to be alive because boy did I do some stupid things. I don't think my parents would agree, but you know. Uh, but a lot of risk taking that happens in, in that time. Last thing to develop, executive function. That ability to stop and think before we do something. Think about the consequences ahead of time, right? How many times do our kids do something and we kind of look at them and it's like, did you not think? They did it. They don't have the capacity to believe it or not. It's unsensual, right? They don't. They think about it when they get caught and they could go one of two ways, like, oh, I'm not going to do that again, or the next time I need to do this smarter, right? <laughs> As a clinician, the one that's clini clinically significant to me is I have to do this smarter. <laughs> Those are the ones that throw flags for me, right? Because it's, it's not necessarily about doing it smarter, it's when, when the bad decisions, it's about not doing it. So, um, this was just like a quick recap. So, what's important for parents is to know what they're capable or not. Oh, by the way, impulse control, that 25. You know, and if you have a child that has ADD and ADHD, on top of that is a diagnosis, it's a double whammy. So in essence, you have to be the executive function for your kids. You are the ones that have to set the rules and you have to set the boundaries. Giving kids too much free reign, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this, and by the way, I have it here just for the time, um, because even though I'm wearing glasses, I can't read this one. Um, <laughs> But I know how to read a watch. Most, most kids today don't know how to read a watch or, or a clock, which I found very interesting. Um, so in setting up the rules and the structure, it's knowing that kids do not have the ability to self-regulate very well. I don't know if that sounds familiar with those of you that have teenagers, right? They start to play a video game, they can sit there for actually 27 hours. Right? Not thinking about tomorrow, I have to get up for school, I have a test, I have to get up early. Yeah, no, you know, kind of not there. So this is why it's so important to set up a container for it. Okay? So now I'm going to go into the baking, but I think it's really important to know, especially for the young, what, what happens in, in, in the brain. So we're, we're definitely, you know, swimming upstream. I think, I think we've progressed in this area of vaping, but vaping is also that's very much supported by, you know, um, the, 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 the social out there. We're seeing it, you know, on the net, Instagram, everywhere, everywhere. Um, and what we do know from a statistical perspective, and, and this totally aligns with the years I've been doing this work, and I've been working um, substance abuse, particularly with um, adolescents and young adults. I work with people of all ages, but that has been, you know, my, where I've been there most is that there's a lot of influence that comes from the peers at that age because they're also at their social peak. 
me at my age, I don't need to be going out every weekend. In fact, it would be great if I got home and somebody said, I'm grounded, give me your phone. I'd be thrilled. Uh, I'd be thrilled. Um, anybody want my phone? Um, <laughs> you'll take it. You've got to answer all the calls that come through. I do crisis management, too. It's another thing on my <laughs> all yours. Um, you take you take a phone away from for from a teenager. Let's not even go for a day for one hour, <laughs> right? Meltdown mode. It's over. Life is over. So we're swimming upstream with this. What are teens inhaling? Um, there's a survey that's done every year. It's done through the National Institute of Health and it's done by the University of, of Michigan and it's been done I think for about 40 years now. Every year they go out and they poll students throughout the United States from 8th grade, 10th grade, and, and 12th grade. Vaping has only been on the, on the study now for two years because it's a relatively new uh, device. But here's what we see that the numbers are, are doing. And, and just to summarize, in the past year, 12th graders, 37%, 10th graders, 32%, 8th graders, 17%. I will tell you in our local community, those numbers are definitely higher than this. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is nationwide. And we have a number of these that are, that are doing the nicotine, marijuana with hash oil, and just flavoring. The vape sickness, right, you've all heard of the vape sickness and the deaths, right, that this was really big um, a few months ago. What scares me the most about that is, of course, people dying and people getting sick, but it's homemade pots. Has anybody seen a, a jewel? Yes. Yeah? Because uh, I have some, I have one here if you, if, oh, sorry, if, if you have it. Um, and what the pot actually is. So what's actually in a pod? And the pod, and that's the pod right there, right? So what's in that pod? <laughs> yeah, 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 we got the pod there. Um, this right here is that there. That contains 200 puffs. It's the equivalent of one pack of cigarettes, which is 20 cigarettes, okay? In that, which is the size right there of this here. Now. When Jewel made this, they said that once a person goes through the pod, smokes the pod, it's disposable, you get rid of it, and you can't tamper it. Here's the taking apart pod. You can, it's so easy to open. Yep. I mean, I was able to open it in, in, in a heartbeat. And what's happening is that people are filling it with what they want. So a lot of folks, especially teenagers, are filling it with THC oil, okay? And they're getting high with it. So they tamper with them, put the THC oil in it, and smoke it all the time. When Juul actually makes it, it's salt-based nicotine. There's a difference between salt-based nicotine and free-based nicotine. Free-based nicotine is cigarettes and, or, and, and some of the oils. The salt-based is actually a formula that has been put together that is stronger than the free-based. <coughs> and our good friends at Juul that have our best interests at heart <laughs> have said to us, this is great because you know what? You're going to spend less money because when you take a hit off of the Juul, it's going to be stronger, therefore you need less. So let's think about that from the perspective of addiction. Do we think you're going to need less or more? More. More, more because what it does is, here it is, take the hit, dopamine goes up. The two most natural reward dopamine releasers as human beings, food, for sure, and then sex. Food releases about 100% dopamine. Sex is about 200. Video games, ladies and gentlemen, are at 175. 175, so we've got video game addiction, right? That's, that's running pretty rampant. And then above that comes marijuana, alcohol, bam, 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 any, anything else. The teen brain, remember how it's developing, right? Anything that's introduced as teenagers, 
releasing a bunch of dopamine, limbic system fully reward, re, um, developed, the brain starts to hardwire, this feels good, and I'm gonna need this for the rest of my life to survive. Most people that develop a substance use disorder started using as teenagers. And it doesn't mean that they were addicted as teenagers, but the use began there because it feels good, hardwired, brain matures, and it's it concrete in there, okay? Same holds with these devices that are creating huge addiction amongst the teens. Another thing is it doesn't smell very much, some don't smell at all, and they can do it anywhere. In the bedroom, in the bathroom, um, at school, in the bathrooms, at school, airports, I've seen people in the airport sneak into the bathroom, hitting their door. You can do it anywhere. Back in, back, you know, most people wouldn't smoke inside their house or whatever, and they had to make it a little bit more challenging. But people are able to do it more, hence creating an addiction. Can we hold on to the answer? So, you all remember your question? Would you remember it? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs> Again, coming back to, to the huge dangers with the THC. And THC, too, is, 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 is rampant. Um, it's much stronger. It's not the product of the 60s and the 70s, peace, love, and happiness. Uh, it's a uh, cheap lane. I'm sure you're getting lots of calls with people more and more, right, with quote unquote just marijuana, uh, leading to huge, huge consequences, psychotic breaks. I, I, a few weeks ago, I met somebody who thought he was Moses and was going off with the disciples. You know, it's, uh, you know, uh, Jedi warriors, uh, people that are having very severe psychotic breaks from the potency of the marijuana and the THC oils that are out there. Um, there's another talk that I do, marijuana, reading out facts from fiction, because I'll tell you, boy, these kids are good at trying to sell me of all people on why it's good to smoke weed. I'm gonna, get to <laughs> I'm gonna tell you why. So I'm to play a card game to me, it's good for cancer, it's good for glaucoma, it helps my stomach. Nobody's ever died from a weed overdose. I better win on high. Can you get this, right? So then I'm like, okay, so why are you here? Because I didn't go out to get you, you came to me. Oh, because my parents are crazy. The problem with my parents should smoke with me. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and you know, respecting everybody's own value system, right? Because everybody has different positions on it, but being aware that there are quite a number of dangers, especially for the teenagers, right? Because they can become addicted very, very quickly. And, and in essence, another thing that I do is interventions. I can't tell you how many interventions in the recent past I've done for young 20s that we've had to pull out of college due to their marijuana use that started when they were young. Does it happen to everybody? No. But is it happening more often? Yes. And with the young ones too, since it's marijuana is not legal and we're going through all of this, when the perceived risk of something drops, the likelihood of somebody trying it increases. What the, the big killers in the substance abuse right now continue to be legal substances. Alcohol, prescription medication, and tobacco. So the legal stuff is killing more than the illegal stuff. So very important to have that awareness and be aware of that. Um, our, our, thank you. Our, our good friend Google. Uh, every now and again I'll pop in and go to Google. And I did a search on, on how to, um, you know, Modify a dual pop. And of course, there was plenty of sites and YouTube videos that show you exactly how to do it. You know, teach. A way to adapt a device so it can be used to bake weed. Options. few different ways to convert your jewel so that you can bake cannabis in it. Uh, it'll tell you what you need, and it'll tell you the steps. And yesterday, you know, I, I went in and I put stealth vaping. Be still my heart. Here's how you can stealth vape without your parents and teachers knowing. Stealth means how do you hide it? Oh. There was this thing of get an empty roll of toilet paper and stuff it with dryer sheets and blow the smoke through the dryer sheets. Yeah, I learned every day from Dr. Google. Um, <laughs> and from my clients, you know. So I recently had one of my teenagers tell me that people are now, and I've only heard this from one person, um, crushing pills and vaping. Do I believe it? I do. I do, because it's about the higher high. It's about the higher high. This is what these kids do. These kids are very impulsive as well, too. Right? Remember how we talked about the whole... Right. 
The only people that, that, that will hold out to the finish line on the brain development, car insurance. When does car insurance drop? 25. They're, they're not gonna take a chance. A lot of hotels won't rent to 18 year olds without a signing. They wait to 21. <coughs> I don't know why, just when you say you're two people checking in and you're actually 104, I don't know what it is, right? I remember I did that, but um, this isn't about me today. <laughs> so the lungs, what actually is happening with the vape sickness is that obviously our lungs are not meant to have oil um, in them. Every person that has been, or let me take that back, every sample that has been taken from um, the juices of people that either have become basic or have died have one, two things in common, one at 100%. Each and every one of the, the, the oils that they were using had vitamin E. Okay, so 100% across the board, this tells me it's homemade. Who's at most risk to buy homemade stuff? Teenagers, because they're not old enough, right? And 78% of those pods also had THC oil. So that's, that's what they have found in the final conclusion. So what happens is, you know, we got the cilia, which is the little hair in the lungs that move the oxygen. The oil is trapping onto those hairs and they're getting stuck together, like obviously like wax on the candles. Those hairs don't move, therefore don't breathe, okay? And, and that's what's, what's happening um, with the base sickness. And the Center for Disease Control, they were updating their statistics uh, weekly, they're no longer updating them weekly, uh, but it's basically what I told you with the vitamin E uh, was, is, is what's happening here. Um, other devices to, to be aware of, and, and this, this is an interesting one. This is actually a pen, and it's a real working pen, and I had one that I showed as, uh, as, as a prop to, it was a group of um, parents and students, and somebody stole my pen. Uh -huh. <laughs> And I had just found it, cost me 50 bucks, but okay. So I have all the other stuff to charge it and everything, but the pen, poof, disappeared. It's a real working pen. The, the cartridge, which is this right here, goes in here, and it's a chargeable pen. The top of the pen, as you go clicking it, will control the temperature. And then you take off the bottom part here where the ink goes out, and that's where you take the hit. Then you put it back on, and it's a regular pen. It works. It works. So being aware of these devices. Here we have a watch. You see it here? Plugs right in here. Looks like a looks like the iWatch or the Apple Watch. Uh, it's not an Apple Watch. It's not made by Apple. It's made obviously by one of these companies. But again, we have this. And then we have the copycat. This is the one right now. Hot, hot, hot for kids. Okay, that's the one that they're using now. Uh, candy pen. Good thing it's not marketed for children, right? We're, we're safe here, as they have said. Imagine if it was. I, I'm, you know, they really have our best interest at heart here. But that's the one right now that's being used. And again, you know, uh, our, our friend at Candy Pen says, you know, once once you use the pots, they're disposable and you can't tamper them. Guess what? You can. You can. You can and they do. Um, so it's, it's about being very cognizant and being very, very aware of that. So what to do? What to do is to do exactly what you're doing today. Educate yourself, know what's out there. You know, be very present to, to what is going on and, and what, these, um, what our kids are facing. In, in the years I've been doing this work too, um, it's fascinating how we are as human beings you know, your kids, depending on the age, so obviously start going out, and one day they may come home and be like, oh my God, mom, there's people smoking pot at the party, and, and, and this was like, or smoking the dab pen, right? Pot, I don't know, people don't smoke a lot of joints anymore, it's the dab pens, and, um, and they come home like freaked out. And then, you know, we have our, our teachable moment, we talk, and they go to bed, and it's like, we're like, yes, we got this, they came home scared. Um, great that they talk to you, right? But being very aware that if they see the abnormal long enough like we do, it becomes normal. Yeah. yeah. Right? It becomes <coughs> normal. So they're going to see it a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a tenth time. By the fifteenth time, it's like, yeah, no, they may not even notice it. The, 
peer pressure. Everybody's doing it, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of people doing it. Yeah. Um, but making sure that you set up the rules in your home based on what your values, your morals, and the expectations of your family are. And being very clear. If your position on it is no, being clear that it's no. I've heard parents tell their kids, you know, I prefer it if you don't. <laughs> That's green light, right? That's how they're gonna interpret it. Remember, their capacity to make decisions right now is not at the best because of the brain wiring. They need clarity. And they may still try it, and they may still do it. And then what becomes very important is how you respond as a parent to that. The best teacher we have is consequence. It's the best teacher. Um, part, of, part of the world right now and the growing up, our kids have become very accustomed to immediate gratification. This right here is a world of immediate gratification. Because I still remember the day that my phone was hanging on the wall with that cord thing that I would sometimes <laughs> trap myself in. Do you remember? Right? 20 feet long? I remember I had that long cord so I could get away from my parents and stretch all the way down, you know. And, and then I remember too my mother picking the phone, hang up, it's, I need to make a call. And I'm like, really? Don't you know it's me? You know? Um, we had to wait for things. Now they don't have to. You forgot the name of a movie, right? You know, back in the day, it was like, oh man, does anybody remember this name of this movie? No. Now it's like, Google, right? And you can put anything, right? Woman dressed in a pink skirt with white polka dots movie of 1980. Bam! You know, we don't even have to have that much information to be able to get it. So we have to teach them. We have to set it. I love to use the analogy of painting the lines on the road. You set up the structures, like the two lines. You can navigate in here. If they do well, slowly you open more of those lines because they're showing you that they can make good decisions. If they violate and go out of that line or go come step on that line, you bring those lines back in, not as a punishment, but because they weren't able to manage what you gave in front of them. So it's safety. It's you being their helmet. You protecting the development of the brain is, is, is integral. Talk to your kids, talk to your blue in the face. Believe it or not, parents still continue to be the number one influence. There's a lot of influences, but parents continue to be the number one influence. Kids at the end of the day don't want to let their parents down. And that's a beautiful thing that we need to use to manipulate, I mean to, um, <laughs> <laughs> to encourage them, right? To encourage them to, to do the right thing. Uh, very important. As much as you can, know your children's friends and parents. If there's a shift in friends and you don't know them, that's a flag. Mm -hmm. That's a huge flag. Also, you know, UrbanDictionary.com, if you start hearing vocabulary and words that you don't know what, what it is, um, you know, look it up. You know, what, what is the lingo? What is the vocabulary? What are they really saying? It's perfectly okay to set limits about vaping, alcohol, drug use. It's okay to say no. You know, it's okay to say, I don't care what so-and-so's family is doing. Our family, these are the expectations in our family, it's, it's these. And live by the values and morals of your family. Have consequences for violations. Be a role model. That's been, I think, repetitive through all three of, of, of the conversations, right? And if you discover a, a problem, please confront it. You know, I've had people, I'm more in the treatment world, I, and I have people tell me all the time, why are you out there talking prevention? You want to treat people. And I'm like, because prevention is much easier than treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Prevention is much easier than treatment. The world of substance abuse is a very painful world for the person that is using as well as the family. To me, it's, it's, it's a family disease. Yeah. But if we can prevent, right? And there's a lot of open recovery. I'm not going to tell you that there is, because there is. But it's really hard work. Prevention is easier, and the age we need to protect is the teen and the young. Yeah. Us as adults, this is all about us too, and we have to make good choices, but we got to protect these brains. This is the age, because not everybody has their best interest at heart, right? And our kids have too many friends. They need parents that are going to be the helmet, and we're going to have to hear every now and again, oh, I hate you, and it's like, okay, I'm doing my job. They really don't, you know. 
And the good news is with the maturing of the brain, if it's about 25, you know, our, our life expectancy has increased, right? People are, I, I don't know about you, but when I see, what was it, Kirk Douglas, 103? Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, Right. I, that's a long time. But I have a friend of mine that she's a, a neuropsychiatrist who says that those extra years of life have actually been added to the 20s and 30s because kids are staying home longer and a failure to bond. So I'm here to tell you again, good news, those of you who have teenagers, if you're lucky by the time they're 45, they'll move out. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> 45, the mature, brain will mature and they're going to just kind of select. I've had parents too that, that this, this is really funny. Met with them, they have two kids, 30 and 31, and they want them out of the house. They even went to the point that they bought a smaller house to make them uncomfortable. And I'm like, it didn't work, did it? Like, no. I said, who's uncomfortable? And mom and dad are like, we are. <laughs> right? So thank you, folks. The Food and Drug Administration is kind of stepping up, uh, and I'm going to say kind of because, you know, at the beginning they were really hard and now they said, you know what, now that we've worked really hard on this, give us five years to come out with an answer. And I was like, phenomenal, we'll have more people drop, that'll, that'll be great. Five, five years is a perfect time, like, yes, yes, yes. For them, yeah, their, their timeline definitely sounds like it's different than yours and mine. Um, can you tell me if you know the, the smoke when you're using the dual, just the dual, okay. um, when you're using the oil, does it smell like pot when they exhale it? Can you no. smell anything? You, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, depending on the flavor. There's some that, that usually there might be a sweet, depending on the flavor, right? Uh, but but the, the oil, in general, no. Um, or minimal, it'll smell, it, it definitely will not smell like the flower. Okay. The flower is very, very, very strong. It's a muted kind of smell. Just one more question about the wax that you talked about that goes on the lungs. Yes. Um, does that happen only when you smoke oil, the, the marijuana oil, or just marijuana, or the They're oil? finding it, right, they're finding it across the board uh, with any kind of oil, but the vitamin E, one has a cover of toxins that is that is the one that's a hundred percent of them have the vitamin E because it's 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 thicker because some of the other ingredients in the jewel are actually approved by the FDA but for food. You know, which means absolutely nothing from a, from a, an inhale um, perspective. And what's happening with the vape too, this is something very important, is that the person that smokes a joint, uh, say like a cigarette. What's inhaled is about 12% of the nicotine, 12% of the THC, which is the active ingredient. When a person vapes, they're inhaling 95% of the THC and 95% of the nicotine. This, this was just a very brief, because I got half an hour, but, but the in-depth is, is, is big. And then you take the marijuana with the edibles, it's metabolized through the liver as well as the stomach, so it's a double whammy. And then you have the dabbing, which uh, one hit of a dab is the equivalent of four to five joints. And our kids are dabbing and vaping. What's a dabbing? What's a dab? Yeah, what's a dabbing? It's a whole other, a whole other uh, life cycle. What's a dabbing? What's a dabbing? dabbing. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, dabbing is, it's a concentrate of marijuana. It actually looks like wax. Um, mm. Actually looks like earwax. Uh, and, and what it is is, is it gets melted and it's extremely concentrated. There's two ways of doing it, and one is through a dab pen that it's already sold in the cartridges, and the other is through the dab ring. Have you seen one of those? It's actually a bong that you put a nail in it, nail like we use to hang stuff up on the wall. Then that nail is lit with a blowtorch until it's scolding red, 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 hot, and then they take a hit. One hit of the dab ring equivalent of four to five joints. Remember, the potency of marijuana now is no longer two and three percent like the 60s and 70s. It can be anywhere from 20 to 50 to 80 to 90. And then um, what's happened to people is that they go for a second hit with the dab ring. They're so high that they burn their face. They burn. Imagine they're talking to you. They're playing with a blow switch. Wow. Yeah. It's not the same pot. It's nowhere near the same pot that it was. 20, years. Much more dangerous. And many more kids are smoking it and convincing their parents to bring YouTube videos 
you know, uh, and uh, you know, great articles from the scholarly uh, High Times magazine <laughs> that tell us about how wonderful it is for you and why it's so much better than drinking and on and on and on and on. Because it's good for glaucoma cancer. Is it a danger in um, breaking in the second half of the baby? They, they, the studies are still very new on that. They're suspecting that there probably is, but less than cigarettes, but it's still, it's, it's a very new area that's being studied. Yeah, very new area. Does the dabbing have smell, or just like the vaping doesn't have any smell? Just like the vaping. Oh, probably. Just like the vaping, yep. <laughs> Thank you. Will, you will clearly see the effects of somebody that's under, under the influence. What are those? Like high, um, not making sense, possibly some paranoia and anxiety. Um, they, they won't be coordinated, um, talking nonsense sometimes, giggling a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I have a question about the popcorn lung. If that's from the vaping, but is that from cigarette vaping, from all vaping? Yeah, the popcorn lung is, is attributed more to, to vaping versus the cigarette. And, and what it is is an inflammation of the, of the end of the bronchial tubes uh, based on the, 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 the vaping that some people get it again because of the oil. But, but is that from a cigarette? Is that like the thick, is that popcorn lung because of the cigarette, like nicotine? Or is it from the... It's the new devices. The, the vaping, the, the, you know, because you have the mods, which is, you know, you've got the mods, mods, e-cigarettes, whole variety of, of different things. Another one that's popular that I didn't show you here um, is the, the Stig. Again, not, not made for kids, right? But, you know, lush ice. Yeah. And not only that, they have a much flavor and skill that... I know, Skittles, cotton candy, cheesecake. Listen, I'd rather eat my calories than smoke them. I don't know about you all. <laughs> Quick question. So, so they, is there a way to know if they're making or not a test or something? Test strips that you can put on the tongue and, and, and you can know. And there's also a urine test. Uh, but the test for continine is the actual, um, what they test for, and that's the metabolites that our body creates to break down the nicotine. Well, let's bring up our principles right now. Yeah! The, the principals meet monthly to try to figure out, to talk about what's going on in their schools, to talk about what they see and what they can bring you. Um, we wouldn't have as good a community as we have without these wonderful ladies. So if you can please join me in giving them a round. Woo! Dr. McCoy uh, sent his apologies. He has to be here at this evening for a council meeting, and it's very difficult, um, as they can all attest, to, to run your schools, to show up to every single commitment that the community has, but um, he's very supportive of what the work is going on. What, what mechanisms are in place in order to prevent vaping at school, oh. kids taking their jewels to school, that, that sort of thing? Well, our, I have to tell you that our students are very uh, vigilant, and they are the, the number one people that tell us what's going on in school. So I congratulate your children because they do. They will come and they'll tell us, we think this is happening, we saw this, or we heard this, and then we go and we, and we check, you know, what's going on, and in some cases we have found it. Um, we've made a big statement recently um, by, because uh, we did find someone with a jewel, and uh, he was removed from school for a period of nine to 10, 10 days. And the students kind of freaked out because they realized that we were very serious about what's going on. I'm going to tell you that we can't stop it all the time. Uh, but we are very much, I've learned about all these little things that my first time, I didn't even know what I was looking for. It just so happens I had read the paper that morning about, um, about these jewels and then I saw a picture that I realized it looks like a USB. It looks like, if I checked the backpack, I would have probably just gone, oh, that's just a little, because USBs come in this all different sizes. 
So we become very vigilant at, at, at that. Uh, we do have a program uh, that are the D.A.R.E. program, and the D.A.R.E. program is no longer just say no to drugs. It encompasses so much more now. Um, and we started fifth grade with that, and we continue with our, my counselor just left. Um, so uh, we do talk about the, uh, the dangers of this with students. And we are going to continue doing that, and we're going to bring a series of individuals to speak at school to the students regarding this. But as far as we wanted to share information, we needed you to know what's out there as well, because you're going to be the first people to you know, get notice it in your homes. We will definitely, but if they get, as you saw, it could be a pen, it could be, it looks like a, anything. So you could be kind of like chewing on your pen and you don't know, but the kids are smart. They'll, they actually tell us, and that's how we normally find out. So. I think our educating ourselves, as well as you educating your positive role models, that's how we're going to get the scope on all of this. Um, you know, we have to lead by example, and like I said, now that we know more, I had no idea about the watch or anything like that. So these are things that, you know, we're, we're finding out, we're educating you as well. These topics, um, they're, they're very important to us, for your children, for the safety of your children, for the safety of our community. And I really want to thank our presenters, and if you have any other questions for all of our, any of our presenters, I really encourage you, these are our, the experts here. Um, I gathered a lot of information. I'm probably going to bring some of them to my school also uh, to speak to the students and my faculty. Um, our faculty members are constantly being trained on different things. We're doing a lot with social emotional health in the, in the public school system. I'm sure as all of the other schools are, but since we have the largest group of students, uh, we, the students right now, if they haven't told you, they're going through a program right now in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade on social emotional learning and they're seeing a bunch of different videos. Sixth grade focuses a lot on the cyberbullying and then there's different topics in, in the other upper in each grade level that they're touch, touching upon. Eighth grade, the subject matter is heavy. And these the children are shown these videos by very they've chosen um, personalities and different individuals that would be interesting for the students to hear. Um, unfortunately, we're doing it in a very short period of time um, because the state mandated it, but next year I think it will be spread out so it will be a little bit more, give them a little bit more time to think about what they're, what they're learning. But um, from what I've seen of the videos, and I have not watched them all because there's too many, uh, it's actually the information is excellent. They're short, they ask them to think about topics, and then the teachers choose one of the videos out of the series um, to discuss at that class period. So I hope they've mentioned something to you about it. It's happening in all of our schools, 6th through 12th grade right now for the next two weeks. Did you all like the topics? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to hear about? I, I, I would just like to thank everyone because the more we educate ourselves, the better we are to prevent these things from happening to our children. I also am going to put a, um, Eric Lang on the spot here to tell us a little bit about those team talks. Those are really important. I counted about 70 people in here and about at least 10 different organizations. Uh, I have to really take my hat off to you and these principals and their staff and Melissa and her staff, they do so much hard work every day. And when we're in front of groups um, constantly, we're always being asked questions like you ask. And I know that their mission is to keep your kids safe and educate. So I have to share that we've done a lot of work, Tony and I, and a couple other folks uh, started the Teen Talks in 2015. We went to Mr. Rafa's school at the Kane Center, and to be honest, we kind of hijacked the meeting. Yep. I remember that. That's, that's where it started. And in 2015, we got in front of probably about 500 families, I guess. And we realized that in a group like this, very quickly we started getting this panic. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And we, what we realized is we needed to get smaller groups, and parents and kids together and start talking about risk and giving parents better tools, which is exactly what this is all about today. And I'll just uh, challenge you to say that moms, especially dads as well, you have one of the hardest jobs in the world. Oh, yeah. It's 24 7, no vacations. If you don't believe me, go pull up Hallmark Mother's Day job. <laughs> you seen it? You gotta watch it. It's three or four minutes to make you cry, make me cry. And, and, and the, the point is, is, is is engage, keep doing this. This room had 70 people in it, it needs to have hundreds, if not thousands of people. We can't do enough work to keep preparing our kids. I'm gonna tell you, just 
The goal is when we're hired, I just went through 150 applicants, and they don't have the soft skills that we need to get them to get in the workplace. And so we got seven-year-olds, nine-year-olds, four-year-olds, 13-year-olds, the kids we're dealing with every day, the, the kids that are graduating high school, we got to prepare them better for the future. And so that's the challenge. Uh, everybody here's probably got a, a great story. Um, Melissa is in the back, Melissa Solano. Uh, you can reach out to me at the fire department. I got some cards on us. Melissa's with us now at the fire department. She's going to be organizing some team talk. We've been a loser tonight. And uh, she may be getting a promotion. Uh, so, uh, anyways, thank you to everybody here. Thank you for the plug on Team Talks. And if like, we have a question. So, as far as topics for the future, um, I was sitting with a parent who has an older child in mind, and she was talking about how her kids are going clubbing, and they're in high school. So, how are they getting these fake IDs? How are they getting admitted to the clubs? Or is it a club just for high schoolers? So, I wonder if there's a way to open topics for you know, my kids are 11 and 14, for parents to come out and share, you know, some kind of behaviors, not talking about their kids, but just sharing with us so we can open our eyes and just be aware and looking for certain things like these experiences. I would have never thought of that. And then, are, is there alcohol at that club? And so if there's a possibility to kind of open up the dialogue for the parents to be the speakers to share with us that don't know so much and haven't been exposed yet at that age of our kids, one, and then uh, two, I was just curious, is uh, for the incident that happened with a young lady that got approached by the gentleman, is there a way to go into the firehouse just to run in and say, I need help? I was trying to figure out how to tell my girls if they're in the area where to go, and I was showing them the steps to get into the police station, but I couldn't find a way to get into your um, area just to be safe and say, hey, help me. Generally speaking, if anybody's ever in danger, you want to go to a public, well-lit place. That's the general yep. rule, right? The fire station is in front of the fire station. Um, if you look around the fire station, the two main entrances, the front door, and, and right in front of the fire station, there's a doorbell. And you ring that doorbell, and bells will ring, lights will go off, and uh, you'll, you'll hear it. Um, as far as the topics go, um, we're constantly in touch. I mean. And texted me, you know, on the way in here, and you know, and we will pick up the phone and we'll talk to anybody. If you have a topic that you want to talk about, we'll post any place. I'm, I'll, I'll speak for everybody. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll we'll host the topic any place, anywhere, for anything. And so uh, I've done, I've had a meeting like this before for two people. And so uh, we've done open open mics, if you will, like open forums, so whatever it is you want to do, and then what I would ask, when you see these things very much similar to what's happening, is that we keep sharing, keep distribu distributing to, to different populations, because the more people we get here, that's the only way. And please let your friends know that you came to this and what you learned, or, you know, and, and so just so we can keep spreading the word. It could be offered at night time for the people back mm -hmm. here. Absolutely. We, 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 we're that. trying to find which works best we, for people. Uh, this we actually both. seems to work best because the ones at night, I'm not, we're, sometimes we get the parents, then you guys know you're in the middle of dinner or bedtime or whatever, so it gets hard. But turnout wise, this is a very good turnout. This communication is key. If you talk to your kids, have an open communication and tell them, I'm not going to fault you. Tell me. Let me know what's going on because you're going to find out through them as they have said, but you have to talk with them. Sit with them in the car, drive with them, talk to them, because you'll find out what's going on. People are hosting parties at their house with alcohol at them, you know, young. And you know what? You don't know that, but those parents can go to jail for that. Mm -hmm. And you know what? If you know about that, you need to get involved in that, and you need to tell your children. I had a code word to my kids. You call me and say, I don't want to be here. You don't have to say that. You say that code word. You call me. I come pick you up. No questions asked. So communication is key with your kids. I, used, so, to, I used to do the same thing. Yes. If you were uncomfortable at any time, you call me and I'll pick you up even half a block down the street so nobody sees you leaving the party or whatever mm -hmm. um, and and um, I have a 30 and a 34 year old <laughs> we're so wrapped up in not embarrassing our kids right. that we tend not to want to do that but I work at the Key Biscayne Community Church and I was there for Debbie Wanikoff's son's funeral I've been there for many suicide yeah. funerals yeah. and I don't want to go through that anymore and I take it personally we're just so worried about what all these other kids are doing and what the parents are doing. But the parents are just not 
being the parents. I, I, and they're doing it. That's it's not what the kids I, are. As I said, I think all the topics this morning were so important. And the bottom line is, you know, like Chief Lang said, we have a very hard job as being parents that you are the number one teacher and, and you must model the same behaviors. What's the potential of this becoming a statewide type well, of platform? If but that, that's, what, that's what we're working on. But working on. Yeah, we, it's, a, it's a grassroots level, so right now we, we all of you to say you want it. Okay. And so what I heard over and over again was communication, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what our platform is, is communication. So if you took the social emotional lessons that are so important that they're doing in the school for only a two week period, sadly, that's the sad part. But if you got them pushed out on a regular basis to the parents and to the students, and it just came every week and you constantly reinforce that, technology is good for speed and efficiency, right? So if we can pre-program a lot of the messaging ahead of time, we can, it can just flow. And the principal can hit a button and say, hey, I want to emphasize trust, or I want to em emphasize dignity, right? This is what we're doing with our fifth graders, and it would just be pre-programmed as well. So now we take that social communication that's now dominated by divisiveness, and we use it in a very positive way. We see who's engaging with it and who's not, and we have better conversations. But your point of that simple smile, a handshake, a hello, is so important. And, and it doesn't have to be super deep conversation, like you said. You can't imagine what that one thing could do for a person one, at it, a particular moment. It's all based on the MIT belonging cue theory. It's all been proven how do you build strong cultures. Because that's what teach, leave, the principals are trying to build the strongest, safest culture they can, right? So how do they do that, right? So they do it through communication. Communicating their message over and over and over again. So at our first school, which is a middle school in Brooklyn, 15 under kids, for the first time this year, the principal brought in a scanner to scan all the kids. So they found over 50 vapes, right? Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And there were another 60 in the schoolyard, because once the kids realized they were being scanned, they went. So it is overwhelming, the amount of vaping that's going on. And they're right, you have to talk to your kids. And you have to tell them, these are the risks and it's cancer and everything else. But the beauty of this is that it's 24 seven. Parents can get into it, the school can get into it, the students can get into it, and so you have a constant way of connecting. Thank you guys for coming. I just want to say that we want to take our power back, right? Because we've seen all of like, the veils of we have prevention and education. We have incredible things that are being created for our schools to really intervene. But this is, we're talking about how do I connect with my kid? How do I bridge from that language that I don't know? This is the whole point of Teen Talks. And what I see with the fire and rescue department is that, you know, Chief Lang is initiating moments where we can actually have that platform. And so I am really a part of wanting to create that, but I need to know what you're seeing, what's going on at home, what is it that you know that we don't know so we can create that and then open up that dialogue so we can have not only just education, we have somebody just with either just their language of celebrity or whatever it is that gets it clicked that's not just, you, you know, no. Because those are the opposite. So not only do we have to know what the signals are, we also need to know that when I don't have school involved, I don't have a counselor in my room, I don't know exactly what to say, what do I do? And so let us create the initiation for that to go home and have that conversation. But I need to know what that is. So that's our village. Why do we take responsibility about how we can help our community? But we need to know that the community wants this. So this is why I'm, I'm even advocating you come and you speak to our village manager, you speak to Chief Land, you let us know exactly. Is it mandatory that the entire student body get onto the platform? It's an, it's an opt out system, and we load the entire school. If you don't want to be a part of it, you can always opt out. So we, we upload the whole school in like three minutes. Yeah. And then anyone who doesn't want to be a part of it can opt out. But what happens is no one opts out. Okay, I was going to say because the culture, you can't change culture overnight. And I know a lot of eighth graders that the last person they want to be in a group chat with is their principal. You know, so how like that was that was like my train of thought. And also, you mentioned something about the the messages being kind of like predetermined, right? So like you take like your 
the, there's only a certain amount of messages that you can choose from, or could, like if I wanted to express something individually, was I, is I, am I capable, am I able to do that? I default to positive, so you can't write anything in there, so it's all positive phrases that are pre-approved. Anything that goes to the news feed, the Instagram feed that's within it, has to be approved by a moderator. So we bring the editor so people learn how to appropriately post again. And then we have screens the size of this in our schools that live stream all the positivity on an amalgamated basis. So you walk in and you'll see 20,000 shout outs on the screen for our Oak Elementary every day in real time. And it creates a positive social trigger that, hey, I want to be a part of that. Who is this tailored to? Middle school students, elementary school students, high school students? Because as students get older, they disengage. Like you were saying, when they're in fifth grade, I've seen the D.A.R.E. program, it's phenomenal. Children are totally engaged. They forget about it. Once they hit sixth grade, it's gone. Unfortunately, it is totally gone. And I've seen it, I've lived it, and it's something that as they get older, it's not cool anymore. It's not, it's not what they want to be doing anymore. So they disengage. What is this tailored to? Is this tailored to middle school? Does so it go through high it's school? It's a platform. So it's tailored to elementary, middle school, and high school. But you're right about engagement. Engagement in K through six or K through five is very easy because it's much more guided, right? All the principal has to do is set aside time every day to give a shout out and a win. And, and, but we also run contests. So we run a series of contests on positivity, write essays on giving, uh, create arts of work that show uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas is like. So we've created a whole series of activities, social emotional learning activities, that the kids can participate in, get points for, and get rewards for. So with the Miami Heat, we're bringing them in to inspire the kids. So after Tony came and Glenn came, we're running a Miami Heat contest for the next six weeks. And the kids will write essays on different things. And the top five students will get tickets to the Miami Heat game to take one of their parents with to go and be celebrated there so that there's an experiential reward. What's the participation? Like, do you get a lot of children actually participating? Yes, we do. I can show it to you on screen in real time. So the number of shout outs we map on a, on a regional basis as well. So this year alone in Broward County, we only launched you know, 10 schools, there's over 60, 70,000 shout outs so far this year. So it's being programmed into the day to be a part of the day. Uh, a number of the principals, like Dr. Cagliato and others in Broward County, are focused on social emotional learning and being reflective and having a growth mindset and all these things for part of their homerooms each day. So they're setting periods of time apart to reflect on who you are and the people around you. So they're starting to make that time. There's not time for a full curriculum, the way education is set up, but we have to infuse social emotional learning back into the schools and back into our lives. Um, they're competing against each other. We're trying to get them to compete against each other for the most shout outs. And so there is that peer pressure among themselves to give a shout out where they don't get disengaged. That tries to keep them engaged because there is something to gain at the end and they don't want to let their friends down. So this whole, this whole system is in, it, as it is involved, is getting the kids to be positive, saying positive things, and that makes them feel better about themselves. And it does work, because it's, it's worked in Brooklyn, it's worked in other areas, and now we're bringing it to South Florida. I know you're a little skeptical about it, but it no, works. I'm not skeptical, I'm just worried, and I really, really wish that it would work. Because as a parent, I've seen it. I've been involved with, with the school for many years, uh, as PTA, as president, I, as uh, education advocate. And what I see is you're very involved when your children are small. And as your children go, the parents themselves disengage. So, so that's, right. that's where I see it. So we found, to be honest, when we go in, one of the things I talk to the kids about is, everyone knows who Dwayne Wade is, but the one example I get, for example, is uh, we were leaving a game in Washington about five years ago, and Wayne Wade walks around the corner to go to the bus. There's a whole bunch of people standing there. And they're all waving at him. They want a selfie and all that. There was a little, maybe nine, ten-year-old boy standing there who looked like he was very sad. And I just happened to be walking out with Dwayne, and he walked over and he knelt down and said, Hi, I'm Dwayne Wade. And this kid was a little reluctant at first, and all of a sudden had a smile from ear to ear. 
high school, middle school kids, they relate to that. They can, that's why we're involved with the Heat. They relate to the Miami Heat. They relate to something like that. So you try to get them that they can relate to, that it's not just, a, you know, but I understand what you're saying. Younger kids may be more. But when you can relate experiences like a Dwayne Wade and a LeBron James and Chris Bosh and guys like that, and look what happened with, you know, with Kobe Bryant, why he was so worldly renowned, it wasn't just because of his basketball experience. That's another example we're going to use when we, when we continue to go into school. I think that's what gets us over the hump. But your point's well taken. The CBIS doesn't work in, in high school, right? We read all the research. I have some of the best educators in the world on my staff. So when you get to high school, we've turned it over to the students to run it, right? So you take student leadership. It becomes their social network to do good through and to drive. So you have to empower them to take it over at the high school level. We've seen that happen and work very well. You know, middle school, there's still enough influence and there's enough. All you need is one or two spirited teachers who kind of will lead what's going on and the others will follow. But you have to use game theory and game, gamification in terms of having the kids work in groups, right? Because every one of these kids plays Fortnite, for example. But they all play in a group and they all work together. They may not know who's in that group, but they do. So they're already trained in, these, in the, all the gamification rules that are out there. So how do we bring that into the activities where they're doing things together? And so that is the biggest challenge, but we're overcoming it. So, but we're doing it by listening to the students and having them drive it. Because at the end of the day, our kids don't feel safe today. They don't know what to do about online. They know the level of risk, and they want to feel safe. So if you give them a means through which they can increase their own personal safety, they will take it up. Not all of them, but you only need a majority to get that wave going, right? You've got to have someone who's willing to take those first steps so that it'll spread. And so it's hard work. Right? But if we, if we just sit back and do nothing, right? So it, it's an evolution. And the other thing that's important, every community across the country, and I've probably worked 600 schools in the last seven years, every community is different, right? So the messaging is different, the socioeconomics are different, the ethnicities are different, and, uh, and when you walk into a certain type of school, you have to address it one way. You walk into another, it's another. So, um, you know, it's, Everyone's different, but so the idea is to have a network, to have the right content, to have all these teachable moments, to have the conversations, the tough conversations that have to be had today. And if you have that as your starting point, then you'll fill in what, what other needs, the other things your community needs. And you upload it, you push it out, awareness is there. Not everyone's in the mood to open an email or receive something, they'd rather delete, swipe left, whatever. But you know, if you're doing it on a regular basis, you start to set those long-term values that we've lost, right? We don't focus on long-term values, and long-term values make us feel safe and make us happy. So a lot of what Tony talks about are values, and, and so these are the underpinnings. But if we, if we don't get their attention, and we're not gonna get their attention unless we go through the device on which has their attention, unfortunately. And so that's the hand we're dealt today. So we have to work from that and say, okay, how do we turn this? Because we have to connect more with our kids. It's the bottom line, and it's hard. And, I, and I'm not saying that it wouldn't work, and I'm not being spectacle, and I'm not downgrading anything. No. I'm just saying it's just difficult for older children to engage into these. Right. But I will say this. A great leader in a high school can set the tone. And if you give them these tools, or her these tools, guess what? It gives them a lot more volume, right? And they can drive it then. And so let's say, you know, so there are great principles around the country. And so the ones who get it, they run with it and they make it happen. You bring up a very good point about the uh, high schoolers and middle schoolers because I know when I was in high school, 13 to 17 years old, I wanted to feel grown. I wanted to feel like the world of mine. And I did not want any nice influence over my life to bring me back down to this juvenile level because when you talk to high schoolers about these nice, fluffy things, they might look at that and be like, man, that's whack, bro. Why are you using that? <laughs> now, come on, let's get back on Twitter. Get, leave that alone. Leave that alone. But I can definitely say this. Who here has heard of uh, Northwestern High School in Liberty City? Right. You see, now, an environment like that, I was hired by a company to do aftercare out there, and I worked with 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders 
who have dealt with some very, very serious trauma. Some of them have lived three lifetimes with the stuff that they've seen and experienced within their own home and their environment, let alone the school system, right? And here I come as a nice guy with these nice influences, and they first repelled against me. Now, you can think of that being rigid. They might repel, the, the assumption is they'll repel against it, but their depression or their anger or all of these things that they think make them groan or make them hard, they're shells. They're shells, and how do you penetrate a shell? Or how do you enter into new territory that's never been uncharted that you think you understand but don't? You need a bridge. That's why bridge works. I continue to penetrate and talk to them and, 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 and tell them about how great they are and how amazing they are because that's what Bridget does. In Facebook, they share the little GIFs, the little, the little, uh, 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 the little animations. They go like, congratulations, congratulations, right? Bridget is ch chock full of those, right? But aside from many other aspects of what Bridget does, I'm saying this to say that the application works within social media, in their cyber system, and in life. It's a representation of who we should be in life. So that's my piece. I keep hearing communication, connection, and I think it's really important to empower your kids with your confidence in them. You've got brains, you've got common sense, you care, you can choose your path, you have the power to do it, to make that connection and not to always be talking at them or to them, but to really connect with them in that way, to have that confidence. I just thought of that and wanted to share. Again, on behalf of the Principals Coalition for the Good of the Children, thank you for coming out, and we hope you enjoyed the topics, and we hope you do more of these topics. Thank you. Thank you.